1976 saw two abortive attempts at the future. The first was Ronald Reagan's strong but ultimately unsuccessful primary attempt on then-President Gerald Ford. Reagan surged from Ford's right flank, attacking the amiable establishment choice for losing Vietnam and kowtowing to collectivist forces everywhere else in the world, especially at home. The two fought tooth and nail, but Reagan faltered down the stretch. Ford ended up retaining his title of the Republican Party's nomination en route to a loss to Jimmy Carter. Around the same time in the same year, boxing legend Muhammad Ali took on Japanese pro wrestling icon Antonio Inoki. You couldn't call it a fight, so we'll say it was a contest. How it came to be, no one can quite agree on. Inoki spent most of the 15 round competition in the butt scoot position, and Ali threw six punches. So it's understandable that no one wants to claim the rule set that allowed this. Inoki versus Ali ended in a draw, and was largely unentertaining and Ronald Reagan was a joke outside of hardcore conservative Republican primary voters. World where the elderly actor was a threat on the national stage and proto-MMA existed outside of gymnasiums in Brazil, both seemed pretty unlikely in 1976. I must tell those who failed to report for duty th this morning, they are in violation of the law, and if they do not report for work within 48 hours, they have forfeited their jobs and will be terminated. End of statement. The 1980s were spent destroying the breakwaters that the West once felt protected its people from the worst excesses of their own systems. Margaret Thatcher and Ronald Reagan broke the backs of unions, ripped the spines out of their prospective nation's welfare states, and used a series of banana republics as punching bags in their succession of small wars meant to heal the wounded pride caused by Vietnam and the tumultuous 1970s. Social safety nets, higher wages, and other cushions the West was obliged to have in order to draw its working classes away from communism were ripped away. We were naked to the winds of an uncertain world. Ali and Inoki were a bit too early and a bit too weird, but it was now a great time to destroy our cultural ideal of martial arts. There were many champions in the Gracie family. Hickson excelled at Valley Chu, though. Euler dominated in pure jiu-jitsu tournaments. But lawyer and businessman Horion was the best at marketing, which was the language of the new world that the Gracies found themselves in. After spending the tail end of the 80s getting the Gracie name out through Playboy, street fight videos, and everything else he could think of, Horion finally linked up with marketing director Art Davey. Seeking to monetize the mythical family from Brazil who said they could kick the shit out of anyone, the two settled on pay-per-view. It almost ended in Gracie's civil war. One faction wanted the telegenic and athletic Hickson to compete, but Hickson and Horian were both too large in personality to come to any agreement. After near inner office fights, the slighter in frame Hoist Gracie was selected. In 1993, no one knew anything, and most people still thought that if you did karate the right way, you could blow up somebody's heart. The call was, we're looking for people to fight in a tournament where the only real rules are you can't bite someone or gouge their eyes out. We want to figure out what's the best kind of fighting. Winner gets $50,000. Who would answer a call like that? The eight constituting the tournament included an insanely dirty kickboxer, a massive sumo wrestler, a respected but bewildered boxer who ended up wearing one glove to the octagon, and two guys who stood above the rest. We already know Hoist, the diminutive scion of grappling royalty, but his eventual counterpart and partner in fate was Ken Shamrock. Shamrock was a street tough, taken in by an adoptive father, whose last name he ended up taking a standout athlete who ended up in pro wrestling in Japan. There, he materialized in Pancrazy, a weird pro wrestling slash real fighting hybrid where fighters had to wear thigh-high boots and could only strike with open palms. Shamrock looked like he was chiseled out of rock using the sharpest needles filled with the finest anivar and seemed intense and cool in a now embarrassing 1990s way. 
Shamrock and Gracie tore through their first opponents before meeting in the semifinals. When they met, Shamrock and his bowling ball of deltoids outweighed Gracie by 40 pounds of pure muscle. Though Shamrock was just an inch taller than his opponent, the musculature difference was the kind you see in political cartoons making a point about an underdog. He and Shamrock entangled on the floor, where Gracie used his gi to his advantage, cutting off Shamrock's windpipe and carotid arteries. Shamrock protested, but then admitted that he tapped. Gracie went on to fight notoriously dirty Dutch fighter Gerard Gordeau. Gordeau bit Gracie's ear. To pay him back, Gracie held on to his rear naked choke just a little longer than he needed to. To the tens of thousands who had watched it, the cultural image of martial arts was altered forever. The men with coolly named East Asian techniques, the yoked pro wrestler, the boxer, they all fell to a man who dragged them to the floor and turned their lights off by touching their necks. Fighting was evolving at previously unseen rates. Ultimate fighters, who were thought to have solved the puzzle of martial arts, fell again and again, downed by new champions. These were men like former elite college wrestler Dan Severn, Russian standout Oleg Tektarov, and one of the first fully versatile fighters in Marco Huas. Huas, a Lucha Livre fighter, won the UFC 7 tournament, chopping down Paul Varlins with a ruthless series of leg kicks so thunderous that they eventually sent the 300-pounder to the mat. No matter who would walk away with the prize, the sport resonated with outsiders in a world now filled to the brim with them. Why then? Why did all these unwashed masses now clamor for these weird men brutalizing each other? To paraphrase Inspector Javert to Jean Valjean, I'd only known a straight line before I'd met you. Let's look at the culture at the time. As America had just begun to survey the rapid destruction of the 1980s, the new professional culture of the 1990s had arrived. It offered yoga and smoothies, but retained the same bloodlessness. NAFTA made goods cheaper for some. The Clinton crime bill took all those nasty super predators off the street. There was a new set of platitudes about tolerance that everyone could feel good about, as the lines between their professional and personal lives blurred. Or they were just totally dislocated in this new world they were told they'd love. The term politically correct, and then the backlash against it, started taking hold at this time. We usually hear complaints about PC when someone is told they can't shout racial slurs at a Little League game, but it betrays something to think about. This all started becoming a thing when our corporations began coalescing into state-like entities that could fill all our needs. Their human resources departments, afraid of backlash, instituted standards that often protected vulnerable employees but at other times enforced standards of beliefs, outside activities, and anything that would make one too different for the workplace through fear of being fired. Since we have such little recourse against our employers, it was a culturally significant tool. There were obviously good outcomes. It's good to take people's feelings into consideration, but it was never PC culture. It was HR culture. The main point is not to protect the individual now, but the company. We never really stopped doing things because we cared about the feelings of others. We did them because we'd be shoved out of a window with no net to catch us. Seeing a bunch of insane men with dumb tattoos cover one another in blood was a release from the bloodless brutality of life. As everyone in power swept up the macho posturing violence of the Reagan years with the reserve sanitized new violence, it was stark to see men who said, we're fucked up, we don't fit in anywhere, and we will beat each other to death if it means we can survive. Of course, MMA had a very undiverse audience at this time. While as a spectacle, it was noticed by many different types of people, 
Its core fan base was overwhelmingly white and male. There were a great deal of suburban petite bourgeois who could afford to buy those pay-per-views consistently. Then there were a lot of guys who were lower on the totem pole. Among the latter, there were those who felt their prestige in society had taken a hit and blamed that on whatever group they already hated the most. And then the others who were just checked out. Regardless who their bitterness was directed at, the unambiguous nature of the combat portrayed was a cultural reprieve from an increasingly confusing world. The one-two path of a punch to a guy snoring on the ground was still the same. Unfortunately for the sport, the wrong people also took notice. Senator John McCain, who spent his early adulthood dropping explosives in napalm on a tiny agrarian nation until he was shot down, famously likened it to human cockfighting. Of course, McCain was also a huge boxing fan, a sport that offers a similar degree of brain damage in addition to being a market competitor for the then-nascent UFC. And his wife, Cindy McCain, inherited a large distributor for Anheuser-Busch, a beer company that spent untold millions on boxing sponsorships. But it's not like John McCain had some documented history of using his pole for personal ends. Anyway, McCain was so shocked and appalled by the trashy violence of the cage that he could probably barely watch B-roll of huts bursting into flames in Hanoi that night. So he initiated a campaign to effectively ban mixed martial arts. UFC 9 was right after McCain's assault on the freedom to consensual violence. The main event saw a super fight between former tournament champions Dan Severn and Ken Shamrock. With new rules in place, the two men could not strike each other with closed fists, lest they be arrested. What happened next was an interminable affair. Shamrock immediately moved to the UFC logo in the center of the ring. He didn't leave that spot for 10 minutes and did nothing but pivot towards Severn and stare. Severn, for his part, circled around Shamrock and stared back at him. And neither one willing to take a shot. He circled him again and again and again. Still nothing happening. Neither fighter even attempted a strike, save for a single half-hearted jab every minute or two. And you gotta keep your strategies, maintain your poise. This went on for 10 full minutes until referee John McCarthy temporarily stopped the fight. By that time, Severn had made 35 complete orbits around Shamrock. By a rough estimate, Severn had danced about 2,900 feet, a little more than half a mile. You can't just stare at each other. The half hour fight ended in a split decision, although it's hard to imagine anyone who paid 1995 for the pay per view sticking around until the end. These are two of the greatest fighters in the world, but they're not fighting. The damage was done. SEG, the UFC's parent company, suddenly had trouble finding places to fight. Within a matter of months, revenue had sharply declined. Despite their best efforts to work with athletic commissions, it was taking its toll on the promotion. Until an angel came in and saved the sport. A seedy, depraved angel. Let's dig up its bones. It's the 1950s in Galveston, Texas, a hotbed of organized crime. The Maceo family operates a racket that rakes in millions through gambling, prostitution, and the oil business. Joseph Francis Fertitta marries into the family, and soon, the Fertittas and Maceos find themselves in the paper together. In 1960, the law finally comes down in Galveston, and the Fertittas scatter. Some resurface in the desert, including Francis Fertitta's son, Frank Jr. Frank spends 15 years working in Las Vegas casinos before founding one of his own with a business partner, Carl Thomas. It's called Bingo Palace, and in a few short years, it becomes the sole property of Fertitta when Thomas is convicted by the feds for illegal skimming practices. Fertitta changes the name and launches the Station Casinos Empire, and it makes the family very, very rich. So rich that in 2001, Frank's sons Lorenzo and Frank III, also known as Frankie Three Six, not making that up, team up with their childhood friend Dana White to buy the UFC. Dana was a boxer size instructor who had to evacuate Boston because, according to him, feared New England mobster Whitey Bulger tried to extort him. It's a very normal company. Previously, the UFC had cleaned up its rules and tried everything it could to lobby state governments to sanction their fights. But none of those politicians seemed to listen. But in the year 2000, the New Jersey State Athletic Commission established some common sense rules. This set of prohibitions and standards was known as the Unified Rules of Mixed Martial Arts. 
It established mixed martial arts as legitimate. How did Dana White and the Fertitas push this through so quickly after years of futility on SEG's part? Well, the Fertitas were very well connected in Republican politics, and as for Dana White, well... Good evening, everyone! My name is Dana White. I am the president of the Ultimate Fighting Championship. Thank you. I'm sure most of you are wondering, what are you doing here? In 2001, my partners and I bought the UFC, and it was basically considered a blood sport. State Athletic Commission didn't support us. Arenas around the world refused to host our events. Nobody took us seriously. Nobody. Except Donald Trump. Donald was the first guy that recognized the potential that we saw in the UFC and encouraged us to build our business. He hosted our first two events at his venue. He dealt with us personally. He got in the trenches with us and he made a deal that worked for everyone. On top of that, he showed up for the fight on Saturday night and sat in the front row. Yeah, he's that guy. He shows up. Donald championed the UFC before it was popular, before it grew into a successful business, and I will always be grateful, so grateful to him for standing with those in the, with us in those early days. So tonight, I stand with Donald Trump. And let's be honest, folks, we need somebody who believes in this country, we need somebody who's proud of this country, and who will fight for this country. The dark age of the UFC was over. Those forgotten years, though, saw some new stars. Guys like Boss Rutten, Tudor Ortiz, Chuck Liddell, these were people who specialized in styles like their predecessors, but were well-rounded enough that they could implement their malice far more artfully. But still, if a juice to the gills man takes you down and smashes your head in, but you're banned in a bunch of places and can't get on the air, did it really happen? Thank you.